The remains of men can craft a fine terror if brought back from the dead. However, the remains of those from the distant plains are truly a necromancer's greatest find. Hello everyone and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old monsters from the past and breathe new life into them. Or unlife in this case. Today I'm going to be talking about four types of undead elementals. All of these monsters can be found in the Libris Mortis, the Book of Undead from 3rd edition. This book has some really awesome information and ideas about using undead creatures in D&D, so if you have a campaign that heavily focuses around the undead, I definitely recommend checking it out. The four creatures we'll be taking a look at today though are what happens when an elemental is raised from the dead by some form of fell magic. Now these elementals don't necessarily parallel one another the way traditional elementals do. In fact, their very existence just causes a lot of questions about what elementals actually are, and I think that just makes them all the more interesting. Since each of them are so different, we're going to go through them one at a time, talk about what they can do in combat, what they look like, what their deal is basically, and then we'll talk plot hooks. So first up, we've got the Cinder Spawn. Cinder Spawn are the undead remnants created from creatures of elemental fire. They are cursed beings always feeling frigid no matter what they do. They covet the warmth of the living and as such will go after and destroy any living creature they come across. Though despite how a Cinder Spawn may feel, they are ultimately still beings of elemental fire. They glow with a dull blue light, their yellow eyes gleaming with malice. And standing 12 feet tall? A cinder spawn is never a welcome sight. Cinder spawn are different than regular fire elementals in that their bodies absorb heat rather than produce it. If a creature melee attacks a cinder spawn, it's still going to take damage, but that damage is not fire damage, it's cold damage. And this is because when a creature comes so close to a cinder spawn, it's actually absorbing the heat from this creature as it gets close to it. It does this in a desperate attempt to rekindle its own flame. Another way it attempts to do this is by draining creatures who seem to be rich with the light of life. A cinder spawn is drawn to exceptionally charismatic individuals, and any of these creatures it makes contact with is going to be subject to its charisma drain ability. A single touch from the cinder spawn is enough to force a con save on a creature. If that creature fails its constitution save, it's then drained of its charisma, and the cinder spawn gains 5 temporary hit points. The Cinder Spawn is a frontline soldier, but it's exceptional at shutting down certain spellcasters, especially since it will be drawn to them as soon as it senses their energy. But on the flip side of that, it might be good for your party if the Cinder Spawn is drawn to, say, the Paladin. If you have a creature that wants to kill your tank, it's going to make your tank's job a whole lot easier. That is, unless of course you've got a fighter who's trying to tank, and the Paladin is doing something else. I mean, I don't know what else the Paladin would be doing, maybe healing people, but point is, you want to protect your good-looking friends. The appropriately named Desiccator is next on our list. They are small, salt-encrusted monsters that have an unquenchable thirst, which is usually satiated by the fluids of the living. They are extremely light, weighing only about 40 pounds even on the heavier end of their species, and they only stand about 4 feet tall. The cool thing about these little guys is that they're pretty low CR, so they make an exceptional way to introduce the idea of undead elementals into your world to your players at a relatively low level. A desiccator will always open up combat by using its desiccating breath attack. The creature opens up its mouth as wide as it can and releases a cone of desiccating air that does one con damage to everything within its range, assuming they fail their save of course. This attack however is simply meant to just weaken its foes as on the next round, it will go in for some real damage. When the Desiccator strikes a target in melee, they have to make yet another save. If they fail that save, their level of exhaustion is raised by one tier. I think this ability is super interesting, and it really provides a fair but challenging encounter. When the PCs are first hit with this ability, and you explain to them what's happened, it doesn't really have too much of a detrimental effect on the group's ability to fight. At the first level of exhaustion, they simply have disadvantage on ability checks. Not a huge deal in most combat. However, knowing that this is only going to get worse will give them an immediate sense of urgency. It literally puts them on a clock, because they can only take so many hits. If they get a hit again, their speed is halved. Still not the end of the world, but it's definitely not helping any, and if they get hit a third time, now they're rolling everything with disadvantage. This is really bad, they are not going to want to get to this point, and it only gets worse from here. But hopefully they will have defeated the creatures by then. Even if undead elementals or just undead in general aren't part of your overall setting, 
Desiccators still make excellent desert encounters, especially at the lower levels. You could even just change the bit about them being undead elementals and just make them some kind of desert lurking monster. Ultimately, they are just fascinating low level monsters that will prove to be an encounter that's more than just fighting a bag of hit points. Next up, we have what I consider to be the true zombie of the undead elementals, the Necromental. A necromental is created using the undead remains of a creature that was of elemental earth, and often the skeletons of several other creatures. They are most often created in graveyards as all the components are just there for the taking, and as such, most of their body is usually made up of tombstones. Much like the form it held in life, a necromental can glide through the earth as easily as a fish would swim through water. This really makes it ideal for ambushing the players, especially in a graveyard. Maybe the players go to the local church to investigate the slew of missing tombstones. Perhaps they'll think some sort of necromancy is at work. I mean, who can blame them? But the last thing they'll expect is those very headstones to rise from the ground, forming a creature right where they stand. Unlike the two previous creatures mentioned, the necromental does not seek to drain a specific attribute. Instead, its touch drains the very essence of life itself. In addition to being pummeled by massive fists, a hit from a necromental means the target's max HP could be reduced by 5 points or 10 points if it's a critical hit. This ability to decrease the max HP of a player is extremely rare in 5th edition, but you can be sure whenever it does show up, your players will not mess around. Slowly taking away the ability to heal damage your players have taken is one way to make them really consider their options. Now the reason I equated these guys with traditional zombies earlier is because of their spawning ability. Any elemental type creature slain by a necromental will rise as the appropriate type of undead monster for its elemental nature. Meaning that if a necromental slays say an earth elemental or an earth based creature, it will then rise as a necromental, or a fire elemental creature for example will rise as a cinder spawn. Necromentals also have the pesky ability to regenerate, as long as they are within 5 feet of some kind of earth or stone. At the start of each of its turns, provided it meets those prerequisites, it gains 5 hit points back. Aside from actually moving the necromental to a place where there's no natural earth or stone, there's no way for the players to really prevent it from rebuilding its body from the earth around it. That said though, unlike trolls, which are the only other creature in 5th edition I know of that actually has this ability, once they're reduced to 0 HP, they stay dead, they don't continue to regenerate. Last, but certainly not least, we've got the Void Wraith. Now, I'm sure you've already figured this out by now, but a Void Wraith is a creature of undead elemental air. They appear as a formless cloud of darkness with two bright points of red, suggesting eyes. They have a constant breeze that always blows inwardly towards them, as if they are trying to suck in all the precious air they can get. The Void Wraith likes to lurk in the shadows and recesses of forgotten places. When it gets its chance, it will dart out and attack any living creature that passes by. A Void Wraith is surrounded by an aura of near vacuum at all times. It is in a constant attempt to satiate its desire for the air that it once mastered in life, but ultimately it's to no avail. But because of this vacuum it creates, any creature standing adjacent to it, within 5 feet, has to hold its breath since there is no air for it to breathe there. Most PCs will be able to hold their breath for a pretty reasonably long amount of time, so this isn't a huge deal, at least not at first. When a Void Wraith makes an attack against a creature, it literally rips the air out of its lungs, not only causing constitution damage, but also reducing the number of rounds that creature can hold its breath for. If this attack causes them to run out of breath, they have to start making con checks in order to avoid suffocation, as per the rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide. If the creature in question manages to get away and catch their breath, they still took the constitution damage, so that means when they get back into the fight, they're going to have an even tougher time now holding their breath. As you can see, the one thing that ties all these creatures together is their uncontrollable urge to regain that which was lost from when they were alive. This is a pretty common theme with most semi-intelligent undead, not even just in D&D, but pop culture in general. Because of the way this usually works, the source book has these creatures stripped of most of their personality and kind of reduced to this base form that only desires to feed on whatever it happens to be that creature is after. But if you wanted to, you could do away with that convention and have more of an intelligent character that is scheming and plotting to try to regain its essence. Perhaps a cinder spawn controls a small group of undead and sends them out to raid the villages nearby to bring back sacrifices that it can feed on, with the hope being that once it's consumed enough actual life, it can return to the way it was. 
just willing to do anything to shake the constant chill. Or maybe a void wraith has set itself up in some kind of ancient tomb nearby, and it spreads rumors into the lands of the vast treasures held within, only to lure in adventurers so that it can steal their very breath from them. And then of course their bodies end up added to the ranks of its minions. You could even set one of these beings up as a cult that treats them as a deity of some kind. Imagine that. A cult that thinks a powerful monster is a god. Next, you're gonna tell me they start making live sacrifices to the thing. Ultimately, these four creatures do work great as singular encounters, but if you have a villain in your game who is notorious for using undead, they make great minions for the big bad evil guy. Because they're so unknown, you could even have a story arc where your characters are led to the understanding of how these creatures are created. In doing so, if the elemental planes are very prominent in your game, it's very possible an emissary from one of these elemental kingdoms might come to your players to seek their aid. To an elemental kingdom, these creatures would be as big a threat as conventional undead are a threat to human or dwarvish kingdoms, especially since the elemental lords of your world may not have experience dealing with this. Maybe their clerics don't know how to turn undead because they've never had to before. Imagine a situation where a necromental is rampaging through an earthen elemental city that is literally just the start of a high fantasy zombie movie. I really like these creatures because I think they take a monster concept that most players are going to be familiar with by now and they really flip it on its head in a totally unpredictable way. The means of their creation is left very vague in the books, so they're incredibly easy to fit into any campaign setting. And most of all, these creatures will surprise your players. Witnessing the reaction of a party while the graveyard around them erupts into a hulking creature made of tombstone and bone is something you just have to witness for yourself as a DM. If you do decide to use any of these creatures in your game, please let me know how it goes and let me know what ideas you implemented in the comments below. You guys always come up with some really cool stuff, so I am looking forward to see what you guys have to say. If you did enjoy this video and you want to check out more, please be sure to subscribe. I have at least one new video every single week. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.